Thank you very much. In his remarks at the 1980 Republican National Convention, President Reagan explained his interpretation of peace through strength. We, and to quote, we know only too well that war comes not when the forces of freedom are strong, but when they are weak. It is then that the tyrants are tempted. That understanding shaped President Reagan's approach to national defense policy. The wisdom of his words and his vision has been proven again and again through the decades. The Reagan Foundation's Peace Through Strength Award honors those whose, whose service has advanced the vision and strengthened our national security. This award has been presented <clears throat> to our nation's most distinguished and influential leaders. A vice president, secretaries of defense, secretaries of state, generals, and members of the Senate and House of Representatives. Today, we will present the Peace, of, Peace Through Strength Award to two more leaders of the highest caliber. The award they'll receive, as you can see up here, features a bronze eagle perched on a granite base. The eagle was a favorite of President Reagan and all that it stood for, or stands for. It projects American courage and strength. In the eagle's talon is an actual piece of the fallen Berlin Wall. It is a reminder of, of America's role in bringing freedom to the oppressed and of the peace that is achieved through projecting that strength. I have the honor today of presenting this year's Peace Through Strength Award to Dr. Mark Esper. So at the Reagan Defense Forum, we know Mark Esper quite well. In fact, we've checked the records, and he, it appears that he has achieved a perfect attendance for every defense forum. Thank you, Mark. Rest assured, though, this is a far more than, than a perfect attendance award that we're about to give to him. It is a recognition of principled leadership through turbulent times. It is a celebration of a person who has provided leadership for every constituency in the national defense community. His titles tell the story. West Point, Harvard, George Washington University, graduate or degrees, PhD in public policy, Screaming Eagle, Rifle Company Commander, National Guardsman and Army Reservist, Heritage Foundation Chief of Staff, House Armed Service Committee Policy Director, Deputy Assistant Secretary Defense, Aerospace Industries Association Chief Operating Officer, Raytheon Executive, Secretary of the Army, and Secretary of Defense. And overall, a great guy. Um, I hate to sound like I'm reading a resume, but few resumes are so compelling. He has served in uniform on Capitol Hill, at a think tank, at a trade association, in the defense industry, and at the highest levels of the executive branch. He has seen it all because he's done it all, and America is better for it. Of course, that's not to mention his many military awards and decorations. Legion of Merit, Bronze Star, the Kuwait Liberation Medals, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and the Combat Infantry Badge. Uh, and there's maybe a, a, co a coincidence here, maybe not, but Mark's also an author, and for those of you who've read his book, you might have read that he is also a Reagan. His mother is a Reagan, so I'm sure that had something to do with the selection committee, but you, you deserved it anyway. And so for this lifetime of service, for a dedication to Reagan-esque principles, for an unshakable commitment to a sacred oath, the Reagan Foundation presents the Peace Through Strength Award to the 27th Secretary of Defense. Please join me in congratulating the Honorable Mark T. Esper. Michael, thank you for that uh, very kind and generous introduction. I will pay you later, as we agreed. Governor Wilson, Mrs. Wilson, thanks for being here. Peggy, Dove, the whole crew up there. Thank you very much, Secretary Panetta. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me begin by thanking the Reagan Foundation for honoring me with this award, and more importantly, for keeping the spirit 
and legacy of Ronald Reagan alive. For someone who has dedicated his life to our nation's security, it is quite humbling to receive an award in the name of one of our country's greatest presidents, and certainly someone who has special meaning to me. To Buck McKeon, Roger Zakheim, Bob Cochran, and others who founded the Reagan National Defense Forum 10 years ago, thank you as well, and congratulations for what the event is today. Like those awarded this prestigious honor in the past, I was asked to take a few minutes to explain what peace through strength means to me. I began by reviewing the remarks of some of the great leaders and statesmen who stood on this podium before me in years past. George Schultz, Bob Gates, Leon Panetta, John McCain, to name a few. Some of them told stories about their meetings with President Reagan at the White House, where topics such as Soviet missiles in Europe, terrorism in the Middle East, communist proxies in Nicaragua, Nicaragua were discussed. They used these pivotal moments in Reagan's tenure to emphasize the enduring importance and virtue of peace through strength. I quickly concluded this, that this approach would not work for me. I don't have stories like those to share with you today. You see, when Ronald Reagan was elected president in 1980, I was a junior in high school. But that's actually where my story begins. Many of you recall that the 1970s were a tough time for America, not unlike today, but spread over 10 years as compared to four or five. By the end of the decade, the United States seemed to be constantly on the back foot. The Soviets had invaded Afghanistan, communism was on the march in parts of Latin America and Africa, the Islamic Revolution occurred in Iran, and the Ayatollah was holding 52 Americans hostage. The U.S. military experienced an embarrassing and deadly failure to rescue them, a black mark against a storied institution struggling to escape the Vietnam era. We had many problems here at home, too. An energy crisis helped drive our economy in the ground and interest rates into the sky, while the White House encouraged us to wear sweaters to stay warm. Our leaders in Washington seemed to disappoint more often than they inspired, and our allies didn't always stand up, let alone stand tall beside us. It was a depressing period for many Americans. Times were tough, and the future looked bleak. And then, Ronald Reagan decided to run for president. It was the Gipper's optimism, can-do spirit, and character, and of course, his promise to restore our national confidence that lifted up many across this great land and gave us hope. For me, President Reagan's commitment to rebuild the military, reclaim our international respect, and pursue peace through strength inspired me to answer my calling, to apply to West Point, join the Long Gray Line, and serve my country in uniform. Now, as I considered what, I, what to say today, I lamented to my wife, Leah, that I wouldn't have a comparable White House story to tell, to share with all of you. Now, Leah rarely forgets what I did or failed to do, and thus quickly reminded me that I did, in fact, meet the 40th president once. You see, on July 28, 1990, that date's important, President Reagan, Reagan traveled to Abilene, Kansas, to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Dwight Eisenhower's birth. Thousands gathered at Ike's boyhood home to do the same and to hear President Reagan speak. The day prior, as the president headed east from California to Kansas, First Lieutenant Mark Esper and his new bride headed west from Kansas City, where he had just spent a sleepless night at a KOA campground in a linky tent that battled the winds and rain of a passing tornado. No kidding. We got up the next morning, threw everything wet as can be in the small coop that we were driving, and headed off to our next stop. You see, we had already been on the road a few days, having signed out of my unit, the 101st Airborne Division, the week prior. I had a few weeks of leave before reporting to Fort Benning and didn't have a moment to waste. We arrived in Abilene after lunch. It was a warm, sunny day, and we were surprised to see how packed the parking lot was. Now, for the younger folks here in the audience, uh, we didn't have the internet back then or iPhones to tell us what was happening in the next town over. <laughs> As we walked up to the grounds, the large crowd was six to eight rows deep. We worked our way to the front, asking people along the way, what's going on? 
I couldn't believe that President Reagan was going to be there that day. I told, pressed Leah that I was going to shake his hand and be ready, have that camera ready to go. Soon enough, the president emerged from the right and began a long walk down a concrete promenade. And when he got within yelling range, I began shouting my request, Mr. President, Mr. President, please shake my hand, Mr. President. It was embarrassing. <laughs> She's nodding in a, yeah, that's right. The president <laughs> looked my way, smiled, and gave me a hand wave as he kept walking. Now, keep in mind that I hadn't showered in a day or so, hadn't shaved in several days, and was wearing shabby clothes. I'm sure that the Secret Service whispered into the cuff mic, crazy homeless guy at 3 o'clock, keep your eyes open. <laughs> president Reagan passes me. I plead one more time as he rounds the corner, come on, Mr. President, just shake my hand. And then he stops turns around and makes a beeline for me. The people around me are shocked, frozen still, not knowing what to do. Security sees what's going on and converges on us. This is true. As the president reaches out his hand and I extend mine, Leah falls to the ground. She claims she was pushed, maybe by me or the police. I think she was slipped, equally stunned by the moment. The president and I lock eyes, we shake hands. He says something nice. I thank him. We didn't have time to discuss Soviet nukes or the Contras, and the moment is over. I walk away triumphantly having met Ronald Reagan, the president who inspired me to become an army officer. Now this may sound far-fetched to some of you, but we have photographic evidence. You got the picture I pulled out of my, there it is. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. <laughs> the president wearing his Ike button. You notice that the, uh, that the, the picture is slightly tilted, that Leah was falling at that point. <laughs> and uh, that's my thumb underneath the policeman's arm. <laughs> so as she was falling, she snapped this picture. And uh, you can take it down now. I'm sure somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it's one of my low points. I'm sure somewhere, maybe even here in this library, library, there is video evidence, like the Zapruder film, that will give us insight into what happened. How obnoxious was I? What did the Gipper say? And most importantly, who pushed Leah? <laughs> now, some of you might conclude that this experience showed that I had the potential to be a politician. I arrived on, this, on the scene in Abilene with little experience, made grandiose assertions about what I would do, was off-putting in the pursuit of my goals, and when the time came, was prepared to throw my loved one under the bus <laughs> to claim the prize. Now, I say all this because it's a fun and true story. And the last part sounds familiar to those of you who know well the famous saying by Harry Truman, that if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. But it also sets me up to say a couple things, things both serious and sincere. First of all, Truman wasn't completely right. I was fortunate 20 years ago to meet my fellow awardee, Dr. John Hamry. I was a staffer on Capitol Hill. He was the accomplished former DepSec Def and the president of CSIS. I had participated in many of the commissions that they ran, and I found John to be smart and thoughtful and engaging. More importantly and uniquely, John took an interest in the younger folks in attendance. You see, John is a genuine person in that regard, and he became a friend and a mentor to me in so many ways. So when I learned that John was the other wordy tonight. I thought, how lucky am I? And how fortunate have I and others in DC been, I'm sure, to have John Henry as a friend and mentor. I can't think of anyone more deserving of this award, and I'm selfishly proud to share this stage with him tonight with such a wonderful person. So please join me in a round of applause for John Henry. I expect payback, pay John, when you're up here. Now on to the second thing, though, we need to, uh, though, uh, but first we need to go back to Abilene because the story doesn't end there. Lee and I jumped back in the car, skipped the president's remarks, uh, and headed off to Dodge City. Our trip throughout the great American West would continue. A few days later, Iraq invaded Kuwait on August 2nd. I soon found myself in Idaho looking for a payphone to call my old infantry battalion to learn the latest news and to try to get my orders revoked so I could deploy with the Screaming Eagles. 
This great military that President Reagan was built during the 1980s, after all, was going to war, and I was not going to miss it. Reagan rebuilt the U.S. Armed Forces first and foremost to defend the nation, but also to strengthen our hand in international affairs and to backstop his foreign policy. But how good were we after 10 years of the Reagan-Bush era? Hundreds of billions in new equipment like Abrams tanks, Bradley fighting vehicles, and Apache helicopters. A new doctrine called Air Land Battle. Higher pay and better benefits for our service members. And a novel training regimen that includes something called the National Training Center out here in the desert of California. We would soon find out. Operation Desert Storm began in January 1991 after weeks of an intensive air campaign that saw the use of stealth aircraft and precision guided munitions. The ground war began a month later. In less than 100 hours, U.S. and Allied forces crushed the fourth largest military in the world and would do so with minimal casualties. A U.S. joint force and its allies built to defeat the Soviets in Germany's Fulda Gap decimated an Iraqi army that had far more recent and relevant combat experience. Not only was the power and professionalism of this post-Vietnam U.S. military proven, but we also rolled out new technologies, new capabilities, and new forms of warfare that others couldn't fathom. In many ways, we surprised ourselves with this great machine that Ronald Reagan built. We certainly shocked the Russians and Chinese, so much so that both countries, especially the PRC, would go to school on us for the next few decades. We returned a few months later from the heat and sand of the, of the Arabian Peninsula with a renewed sense of strength and confidence. And by the end of that year, 1991, the Soviet Union was no more. Peace through strength had won the Cold War. In the years that followed, I would begin viewing this enduring principle of peace through strength more broadly than just military might. We certainly had the best armed forces in the world, but that was built on the foundation of a strong economy, noteworthy for the hard work, entrepreneurship, and innovation of the American people. A vibrant economy and capable military also enabled an effective diplomacy that leveraged trade agreements, international organizations, alliances, foreign assistance, and a diverse set of partnerships to promote U.S. policy abroad. But most important was our values. Freedom, democracy, individual rights, the rule of law, and all the other hallmarks of this great country embodied in our founding documents that President Reagan believed in so deeply when he described America as a shining city on the hill. These values were, are, and will continue to be what draw people to our great country from all around the world. And yet, there was there is one more rung to climb, one more level to reach, one more factor to cite as I think about peace through strength. And it's the power of inspiration. President Reagan had it in abundance. He used it to rally a nation, to bolster a people, and to embolden individuals, regular folks like me and many of you, I'm sure, to join the military, to serve in government, to help our fellow man. The great communicator inspired people around the world as well, in Warsaw, in Berlin, in Prague and Budapest, and in other capitals and countries in the East and West, trapped behind the Iron Curtain, ruled by dictators or bullied by bigger neighbors. If he were alive today, Ronald Reagan would stand with the people of Ukraine and Taiwan, as well as those seeking freedom in Iran and Venezuela and Russia and China. After all, it was President Reagan who once said that, quote, no weapon in the arsenals of the world is as formidable as the will and courage of free men and women, end quote. It just takes inspirational and selfless leaders of character and, and integrity like Ronald Reagan to lead them forward. This is what peace through strength means to me today. This is what we'll need as we face off against China, an adversary far more daunting than the Soviet Union. This is what we need now to unify our country, strengthen our republic, and galvanize the American people for the task ahead, just as President Reagan did in 1980. And this, my friends, is also why that handshake in Abilene 32 years ago 
means so much more to me today than I could ever imagine back then. Thank you all very much. Good evening. Those of you, and there are many in this room, who have served in government, whether local, state, or federal, quickly learn, if they're paying attention, learn an inescapable fact. You can staff your team with the best and the brightest. You can convene any number of meetings and really drill them. You can look at every problem from every angle. And yet, without, without fail, some of the best ideas, some of the most thoughtful analyses, some of the most consequential policy decisions, prescriptions, will come from outside your administration. Just sure as hell. In the realm of national defense, think tanks. Think tanks of many stripes provide really critical outside perspective. And they offer thoughtful leadership. They provide accountability and they play the devil's advocate, all very useful. Some offer relatively immune to political pressure while filling an important role in protecting our nation. But of all the many think tanks who have influenced national policy, There is simply no match for the best, and no match, <laughs> no match for the caliber of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, known to many as CSIS. Now, CSIS has an extraordinary reputation. And it would not, sit, it would not uh, have achieved so high a standard without its president and CEO. As you may have guessed, that's John Hamry. John served in this role for nearly 23 years. That's more than one third the life of CIS making John almost an institution as is CES itself. His influence in Washington is everywhere. You have just heard from Dr. Mark Esper, the recipient of this same award, who referred to him in his remarks just now as a mentor at a time when he was a young man seeking to learn and to fight for his country. Well, countless others have done as well, both Republicans and Democrats, Undoubtedly, many of you in this room today, but actually, because of the closely held nature of the work, of Dr. Hamry's work, he has also shaped the minds of many in the defense industry, even who don't even recognize it. 
But CSIS is only the most recent act, 23 years. John has served as the 26th U.S. Deputy Secretary of Defense in President Clinton's second term. That was after serving as the Under Secretary of Defense, actually the controller, in the first Clinton term. And before that, he spent 10 years on the professional staff of the Senate Armed Services Professional Staff of the Arms, excuse me, of the Senate Armed Services Committee, which is where I first met him. And that was after he was, was working as Deputy Assistant Director for National Security and International Affairs in the Congressional Budget Office. In other words, my friends, John Hamry has been in some way or another shaping American national defense policy since the beginning of the Reagan administration. I almost said Coogan or Coolidge administration to see if you were paying attention. So to understate the obvious, this award is not only well earned, it's been an extraordinary career. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a task that I am enjoying in celebrating the incomparable career of researcher, scholar, teacher, mentor, and counselor, great intellectual warrior, and American patriot, Dr. John Hamry. Senator Wilson, I, uh, I was overwhelmed when I heard that you were going to introduce me. Uh, when I first started on the staff of the Armed Services Committee, he was one of the towering figures on the committee, and now to have this opportunity with you, it's such a privilege, and I want to say thank you. And before I uh, begin with my remarks, could I ask all of you to say thank you to these young cadets that were with us every day. They were guiding us throughout this day, watching over us, making sure we got to where we needed to be. Would you all stand up and can we then thank you with your applause? days when I'm a little discouraged about our trajectory, I see these young people, and I'm happy. Um, when Roger called me, Roger Zakheim called me to say that uh, I was to receive this award, I, I must confess I was embarrassed. Um, you know, I know the titans of national security that have been recipients of this award. I mean, Leon Panetta and Mark Esper now, deserve uh, George Schultz. I mean, I, I'm just not in that league, you know. And I, I'm not worthy of this award, but I promise you I'll spend the rest of my life trying to earn it. You know, I, uh, I really came to my life in public policy through a failure. Um, I had thought that um, I was going to pursue the ordained ministry as a, as a young man. And I, uh, I went to a seminary, and it took about a year to realize that I was not well-equipped to be an ordained pastor. 
I came to realize that. Uh, but in my experience uh, at Harvard Divinity School, I, um, uh, I also came to find the calling for the rest of my life. Uh, I, one of my professors there was H. Richard Niebuhr, and his uh, brother, his older brother, was Reinhold Niebuhr. And of course, Reinhold Niebuhr was the, uh, the great architect of uh, the ethical underpinning of American foreign policy in the Cold War period. He had watched the tragedies of World War II and saw the emerging battle that we were going to have with international communism. You know, the religious community from during World War II had become deeply traumatized and was largely pacifistic at the end of the war, traumatized by the war. And it was Reinhold Niebuhr that cast the new frame of reference for America in the world. And it came not from his political convictions, it came from his religious understanding. And it's, it's based, uh, he was a, a Lutheran, I'm a Lutheran, and, and uh, it, it grew out of our understanding of the flawed nature of man, humankind. You know, in our, not to be theological here, but it, the term is original sin. What original sin means is that willfulness of people to want to dominate others. That is an, a raging impulse inside everybody. And it was Reinhold Niebuhr that saw that the, the best way to control that, contrain, constrain that, was through democracy. And, and Reinhold Niebuhr had the most, uh, to me, it, it shaped my life. And I wanted to share with you. He said, man's capacity for justice makes democracy possible. Man's inclination towards injustice makes democracy necessary. This is the core of our lives. We are the blessed inheritance of something very unique. You know, demographers estimate that there, are, there have been probably 115 billion human beings in all of human history that have been on this earth. Only the tiniest percentage have had the privilege to live in a democracy. The natural order in politics is authoritarianism. The natural order is for people to live under the domineering impulse of powerful people that want to impose their will on other human beings. And we see that all around us right now. A war, a completely unprovoked war in Ukraine. Why? Because of the, this willful, evil sentiment inside one man who is bringing so much, so much torment to the world. We see it in China. Over a million Uyghurs imprisoned in concentration camps. Families that are being, their doors are being welded shut so they can't go out because of a COVID lockdown. Huh? We live in a precious democracy and it's rare. It's not typical. The smallest percentage of human beings have had the privilege that we have to live in a democracy. So, uh, because we inherited this, it's our obligation to keep it going and to strengthen it. So I, I would like to, I've, I've gone on too long and I've been too personal. I, uh, I apologize for that, but I want to share with you. It was the uh, beginning of the invocation for uh, President Clinton's second inauguration. And uh, and the Reverend Gardner Williams offered the following, and this is the beginning, he said, Gracious God, before whose face the generations rise and the generations pass away, grant us this day that we may so conduct our lives and our affairs that it will be counted of thee worthwhile that we lived. 
what remains of my temporal life I will devote to strengthening this beautiful democracy. And I want to thank the Reagan Institute for making it possible for me to be here today with all of you because I know you share my wish that we strengthen this sweet land of liberty forever. Thank you.